Hello, this is Xbox Ahoy, and this is the bonus footage for the uh, the 5.7, and later on we'll be covering the s'more as well. I'll combine these into uh, to one singular video. I'll take questions from each of the videos, of course, uh, we'll start with the 5.7 questions, and then when, when the s'more footage kicks in, I'll switch over to the, the comments from that video. So, wasting no time, let's get on. 605JIK says, hey Stu, I have a few questions. 1. What jobs have you had in your life, and what have you done in them? Alright, a uh, brief condensed history. Uh, my first job was working in a biscuit factory. I did this for three years. Uh, it was summer work between my, my years at university. I liked that job. It was good, honest labour. It was night shift work, which is particularly well suited to my, my usual sleeping pattern. And it was only four days a week, which was nice. All you have to do, turn up, put biscuits into boxes, or uh, just otherwise, you know, ensure the smooth passage of biscuit from oven into uh, into warehouse. That was basically it. A lot of manual labour, a lot of sweeping up, a lot of uh, stacking boxes. But yeah, no, it was... Um, it paid relatively well because there was like a 20% bonus on top of the standard wage from, for it being night shift. And yeah, it was good, honest, temporary work and that was quite enjoyable. Out of university, I was looking for web development positions or at least some sort of multimedia gig. I applied directly to uh, this company based in Manchester. They're an e-commerce site that specialise in computer components based in Longsite, Manchester. I'm not going to give them a specific name, but uh, I'm sure if you're familiar with the companies of Manchester, you probably know who I'm talking about. Anyway, they had a position open for, uh, I think it was the, the, the exact title was Marketing Assistant. But the job sort of entailed uh, a bunch of graphics work in addition to, to web development as well. Now that role, I was there for three years. It kind of mutated from... The marketing assistant role, uh, I eventually, I think I got the appellation of senior web developer. Senior by virtue of the fact that I was the one that stayed there the longest. It wasn't a bad job, but staff turnover there was pretty gosh darn terrible. In staying there for uh, three years, I think I became like possibly one of the top 10 oldest employees. Certainly top 20, maybe like top 15. No, I was responsible for the website and all that, but uh, it was quite a high-intensity workplace. There was really there were no layers of management. It was me reporting directly to the managing director. It was kind of intense. It was a good experience, a good sort of a uh, lesson in how not to run a business or how to run a business. I'm not sure. One of the two. But uh, yeah, it was a, a formative experience in my my web design moxie. Anyway, I actually uh, I left that job of my own volition just because I, I kind of felt like I was ready to graduate into something else. I spent about six months, I would say unemployed. Not really unemployed, though. I actually did some contract work for Manchester University. I developed a interactive DVD-ROM for... Uh, it was an educational thing to do with... Um, my girlfriend got me into it because she works at the university, you see. Uh, it was to do with linguistics, Romany linguistics, uh, gypsy language, that sort of thing. It was um, it was an educational DVD talking about the some of the sort of the diaspora and the history of the uh, the gypsy language. So that gig lasted for about six months, and uh, I was also at the time I was blogging on a site called Modern Life. Modern Life is rubbish.co.uk, and through this I actually uh, got hooked up with another e-commerce company in Manchester who were looking for a developer. These guys were a mite bigger than the uh, the first company I was working for. They had a global presence, really, with uh, a whole bunch of different sites. They specialised in the sale of communication devices, PDAs, mobile phones. So a similar sort of tech e-commerce here, um, sort of area. I was with those guys for about three years. Uh, I spent most of my time developing CMS platforms, uh, custom .NET interfaces for managing a whole variety of things, basically. And also, you know, just wiring stuff up for, uh, for partners, other clients, that sort of thing and uh, working on features for the actual main site. Compared to my first job, it was night and day. I mean, in my first job, we didn't have any source control. We didn't have any testing to speak of. We just sort of shot from the hip and, you know, if the MD wanted a feature going live, it was going to go live that day. There was no process. Second job, I mean, yeah, sure, you know, no, no company is perfect as far as their approach, but at least there was some degree of testing and some degree of source control. Well, there was source control, which is kind of a critical difference, really. As far as my ultimate fate with that company was concerned, there was, uh, it, I want to say, a bit of financial trouble. The recession kind of took its toll on people spending money on luxury uh, items. So while the company, you know, was robust enough to not go under, there was, you know, acquisition by another company, which resulted in a merger, which resulted in duplication of 
you know, there were two tech teams, basically. And uh, I was eventually offered voluntary redundancy. And this, coincidentally enough, was around about the same time that my Black Ops videos were getting reasonably big. Big enough to the point where I could actually make a, a reasonably good livable income off it. So I took the voluntary redundancy rather than sort of try and find a new role. I mean, after all, I'd, I'd been with the company three years, which is long enough to be in one job. Anyway, after that, um, a couple of months later, by coincidence, I actually got offered uh, a job by Activision. And uh, at the time, I suppose I was more inclined to take reliable income, you know, uh, with a solid job from Activision than I was to bank on YouTube. Because, I mean, you just come out of a voluntary redundancy, you're in a relatively fragile position. So that was probably one of the motivating factors. It's, it's not a question of, you know, selling out. It's, it's a question of how am I going to pay the mortgage in a few months' time. And Activision came along and said, Hey, Stu, we'd like to give you work for the next year. And that kind of story, well, it leads uh, to where we are now, which is, uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of doing the whole YouTube thing full time. I still have a, you know, a working relationship with Activision, but I'm not sure how that will pan out. I'm still waiting on the casting call, you know, for the next Call of Duty. I want to be the guy that tells you that switching to your pistols is always faster than reloading. <laughs> anyway, in the meantime, yeah, YouTube is my thing for now. It pays the bills, uh, that's the main thing. And I suspect over, over the next few months, with a return to relevance and consistent Black Ops 2 videos, I should, be, I should be comfortable enough with my level of income. I'm growing pretty consistently. It's, you know, not as rapid growth as I would like, but slow growth is always the healthiest growth because it's, it's more persistent. And yeah, I mean, my views have doubled in the last month. So I guess I, I shouldn't really complain too much. Anyway, back to part two. Uh, have you ever thought of uploading progress threads throughout the week on Ahoy Xbox? Not edited a lot or even have a commentary, just a gameplay of a few matches with a gun you'll be using. Uh, uploading gameplay has kind of come across my mind, but I don't know, I don't know. I wouldn't say any of my gameplays are particularly spectacular. There's no 100 plus games really on a, well, given that I play free-for-all and TDM mostly. <laughs> but it, I don't know, it's something I might try. It's something I might try, but it's a question of time, really. I am generally better investing effort into uh, the Xbox Ahoy stuff. And it's the attachment videos that take up much of my overflow time, as well as, uh, you know, other projects as well. I have other interests and uh, stuff like the Secret Drinks Ahoy video that's in the works. And as for the last part, have you recovered from your illness? Uh, I'm still a little bit uh, chesty as far as... Uh, you know, the cough is concerned, but I feel better. I mean, I've, I've felt fine for about a week now. It's just I have a bit of a persistent chesty cough and I'm still coughing up nasty stuff. And I guess uh, hopefully in the next week or so that should clear up entirely, but we'll see. At least I think my voice is relatively back to normal. Uh, you know, after a good coughing fit and a drink or so, I should sound just fine for the QBB script. The Real Earl says, is there going to be any behind the lines or game over this year? Uh, probably not until I've finished the Black Ops weapon guides. They are kind of, well, I mean, that's my major income this year. It looks like I'll have a gap of about 10 weeks uh, before the next Call of Duty comes out, assuming that there is a, a next Call of Duty. Uh, during this time, I don't know what I'll be doing. I might, A, take a break uh, and just recuperate and prepare for, you know, the next wave of videos. B, I might indulge in some silly projects. You know, I might do more Beverage Code Expresses, I might just do a uh, game playthroughs on Ahoy Xbox, I don't know. I'm considering options as far as mini-series on Xbox Ahoy are concerned. Uh, not 100% sure yet, but I don't know, I might do like a six-parter on something or, or, or other. I have kind of this, this itch to do some, some sort of more serious videos. Not that my videos aren't already serious, but I mean more intelligent and with maybe a, a broader appeal than just weapon guides. The simple answer is I don't really know what I'll be doing uh, this summer. I don't really know what I'll be doing next year. Uh, it all depends on, you know, where I find success and and how I feel when I finish the Black Ops 2 weapon guides. So you know, in a business like this, you do have to play it by ear. You do sort of have to respond. Uh, you have to react rather than plan. Epic Wookie Leg says, Stu, seeing as you've had both Tommies or in and out that's actually, that's a kind of a tough call, but I, I think as far as the overall quality of the burgers is concerned, I've got to go with In-N-Out. Which makes me a little bit sad on the inside because I love Tommy's. I only managed to get to In-N-Out once, or as Tommy's was my saviour many a time. Elevator Music says, Hey Stu, I noticed in your earlier videos you had a Sargnosis emblem. What were some of your favourite games published or developed by them? 
I forgot to mention what my emblem was this week. It's, it's pretty obvious, I'll be honest with you. It is the Xbox 360 controller. Just in case you live under a bridge, but I appreciate some of my emblems are more obscure than others. As far as Psygnosis are concerned, my favourite game ha absolutely has to be, hands down, Lemmings. It is uh, one of the first games I played on my Amiga, and it remains a fond favourite. I never actually uh, I never actually owned a PlayStation 1, or a PlayStation 2, really. I do actually have a PlayStation 2 now, but uh, never, never back in the day. At the time, I was very much a PC gamer. So Wipeout for me, I never really played it. I, I think I played it around a friend's house a couple of times, but I never sort of... You know, had one of those big, long sit-down sessions with it. Anyway, speaking of emblems, Sniper Fox Hun says, Stu, can you make a tutorial about your emblem in this video? Uh, presumably talking about the, uh, the the dinky little Xbox 360 controller there. Um, I could. I could, I suppose. It takes me some time, though. Oh, I'm a busy guy. If I'm feeling generous, I might actually put together a video based uh, around some of my, my emblems I do this year. Alex Matthew says, how do you know when you have enough clips, Stu? Do you have a set goal, or is it just based on pure judgement? Uh, my general rule of thumb is I stop playing when I've uh, got the gun gold. Normally I start from somewhere through the first prestige, or towards the end of the first prestige, and then I'll take the gun through two prestiges. In some cases, like the small, I already had the gun pretty much gold when I started recording, so I didn't really have like a, a fixed end to recording clips, but you, just got, you have to record a few hours, and then... By that point, you've normally got everything you need. The good thing about clips is you can never have too many, and even if you have too few, you can still get by. In general terms, though, the longer you record, the uh, the, the better the standard of the clips you have. Ben Atkins Chafer says, Stu, what's your favourite Pokemon? We're only talking about the original 151 here. Well, conveniently enough, I refuse to recognise any beyond the original 151. Um... Now, my main workhorse in my... I think I had... Uh, I think I had red back on my Game Boy. I'm pretty sure it was red. But in any case, for the majority of that game, my, I think my main Pokemon was Jigglypuff, who eventually evolved into Wigglytuff. I just... I body slammed my way through red. That's pretty much how I did it. Uh, so, yeah, let's say... Let's say Wigglytuff, just because that's the one I used the most back in the day. And that is as good an answer as any. A Carrot Tree says, uh, What tips would you give YouTubers to bring in new viewers to their videos? In terms of marketing or technical YouTube nitty gritty tips and such, it seems almost impossible for smaller channels to grow without the need of drama, shout outs, or spam. Well, there's never any definitive answer. You know, there's no sort of magic bullet, no sort of do this and you will be hugely successful. YouTube is a very unpredictable beast. However, if you seek growth, what you really need to be doing is producing videos in an area that is both high demand and low supply. It's kind of uh, video economics, really. Now, things like Call of Duty these days are high demand, high supply. Uh, there are no shortage of Call of Duty videos. It's tougher to compete. So to succeed in the, uh, the realm of Call of Duty, you either need to, to network harder than you've ever networked before and sort of associate yourself with with other rising starlets in the Call of Duty scene. Uh, drama can help, but it's really not a strategy to, to work with. Or, or my shtick, which is unparalleled quality, he said with an almost an entirely straight face. The trouble with the quality route is, while it is consistent if you, you know, have the proverbial skills with which to pay the bills, uh, it is also a lot of work. And uh, quantity does actually count for quite a lot on YouTube. At the very least, you need to be consistent. The weekly schedule kind of works for me, although really I kind of I do two or three videos a week at least. I mean, if you count these bonus videos. But there are people out there who are doing daily videos, and while there is simply no way I could produce a weapon guide a day, it's it's completely out of the realm of possibility without a team of people working alongside me. There are people who sort of they they do get videos out every day, and that does count for something on YouTube. Sort of to be that regular does have its merits. The long and the short of it, really, uh, my advice to a new YouTuber is don't do Call of Duty. It's, I mean, if you've already got a sort of a fresh angle on this thing, then great, then go ahead and do it and you might find success. But no, there's, there's stuff that's second in line in terms of popularity, but is much less explored in terms of video content. 
you've just got to choose your focus and really you know it should be a game that you yourself enjoy if you don't enjoy the game you're playing you're in the wrong business so if you like Battlefield, I mean Battlefield is on the, the downslope on its demand curve now, but there'll be a new Battlefield out soon enough. If you commit to a Battlefield weapon guide, whether it's Battlefield 4 or whatever, and you stick to a regular schedule, you will attract an audience. As far as speeding up your growth, there are a few means. Uh, you can sort of submit to sites like uh, Reddit. There are communities for pretty much every single popular game. And if you are honest and humble and a part of the community, they will generally be fairly grateful for any videos that you produce that are of a high quality. Anyway, I, I could carry on sort of talking about this. Uh, it's obviously something that's very, very sort of uh, important to me as it is my profession. I kind of, I think I should, I don't know, I think, I feel like I should do a series on, uh, on tips, stuff like this. I might expand my uh, user interface concept. I kind of want to start blogging again. I don't want to call it a blog though, I detest the word blog. I want to start professional writing. So I might start talking about um, stuff like YouTube and, uh, you know, uh, marketing promotion, that sort of thing, or just sort of natural growth on YouTube, how to, uh, to tap into viral markets. We'll see, we'll see. Anyway, you might notice the absence of the 5.7. It looks like we've broken into the small clips. Oh, yes, baby, we've got hot UAV shooting down action coming ahead. I had a few more questions from the 5.7 video, but I'm going to skip over them mercilessly and proceed to the ones that I picked from the small video. Super Bigfoot 777 says, Stu, where is the next assault rifle weapon guide? Because I think you missed one. No, 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 don't worry, I got this. I'm perfectly well aware of uh, the progression of my series. I've been keeping tabs on this. It is my plan to cover all of the weapons that are unlocked by default first. So that includes everything that I've done so far, in addition to the QBB, the DSR-50, the Sega-12, the TAC-45, and the FHJ-18AA. I may also slip the Peacekeeper, the DLC weapon, into that progression, and then from that point we'll be going up the, uh, the unlock progression. The first unlocked weapon, after the default weapons, is the SWAT 556, the third assault rifle. So we've done the MTAR, and we've done the Type 25, and uh, the SWAT's the next one, but that'll be after this block of default weapons. And then, if you're curious, we'll be going up in level order. Uh, there are no real surprises. The last one probably will be the AN-94, unless there's a DLC weapon released after that. Try Ash 122 says, So, Stu, did you get any hate mail when making this episode? Surprisingly, no, actually. Um, I didn't actually record that long with the s'more. Like I say, I, when I started out, I already had most of the challenges done. So I just, like I say, I, I played for a little while and uh, shot down a bunch of UAVs. I did get a few double kills, I didn't get any triple kills, that's because you only get one rocket and everybody rocks flak jacket and I'm sure the s'more is nerfier than the uh, the M72 lore. So I, I did, I mean I, I recorded until I was generally satisfied, but I did have to get two out in a single week so my time was limited. But yeah, surprisingly very little hate mail, which is uh, probably testament to the uh, supreme overbalancing of the explosives in Black Ops 2. Alfonso Navarro says, Stu, what do you think of the foregrip scandal? Well, I don't really think it's a scandal. I think someone's been watching too much drama alert. Well, it rather seems that, courtesy of a couple of YouTubers, that the general consensus on the grip is that it has no effect. Now, the thing about recoil is that it is random and it is notoriously hard to get anywhere close to the hard data from shooting at a wall a few times. Uh, now, I appreciate, yeah, okay, with the grip there has been a lot of shooting at walls but there's still no hard data on it. I think my understanding is that the grip does have an effect, but it seems to be that the effect is so small that it is obscured by the uh, the random nature of recoil. I think it's, it's rather like having a, a loaded coin that comes up on heads 2% more than it does on tails. Now, if you toss it a few times, you're not going to notice a difference. It's going to seem pretty fair. To really establish the fact that the there is a statistical anomaly, you have to sort of test, what, thousands of times, you have to repeat that, just to sort of, to get the level of, of data required to comfortably assert that, you know, there is a 2% difference in the coin flippitude. I think that's what we're seeing with uh, the grip, because we're dealing with random events of a relatively small nature, we're, we're probably talking a couple of percent, you'd you'd have to shoot millions of rounds to get, uh, you know, anywhere close to what the hard stats could tell you. I suspect 
the grip does have an effect, I suspect it's very minor. Maybe there's some really funky stuff going on. Maybe um, the grip does have an effect, but it's only for the first three bullets fired. If you fire full auto against the wall, it's just going to revert to full recoil. Maybe that's the case. I mean, they, they certainly have the means to do that, like with the, the hammer, which fires, like, what, six, seven rounds at a higher fire rate than the rest of them. Maybe the grip operates in a very similar way to encourage burst firing. Maybe. Maybe. But uh, all in, I don't have any hard data. Nobody outside of Treyarch has any hard data. So, you know, it's kind of a difficult call to make. One thing that I am certain of is that it has been blown out of proportion. Scary Hands 5 says, Thoughts on the Fable series, Stu? Uh, in summation, uh, with regards to Fable 2 and Fable 3, both of which I've played, I have never enjoyed a disappointing title as much as the Fable series. That is to say that the Fable games are on some level disappointing. I think it's mostly Peter Molyneux's promises, you know, about you can do anything. And then it turns out that it's just, it is a charming little uh, role-playing game that's hugely simplified on many levels, but still has a compelling story and uh, a charming world. Honda's Best says, 22 Hornet Blank as propellant. Dang, that's a light RPG. No, 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 you misunderstand. It's on the spotting round, which is just a 9 nil tracer. You fire the spotting round, right? And if the tracer hits where you want to hit with the rocket, then you can go ahead and fire the rocket. I mean, I guess it's not so useful against, like, a moving tank or something, but against a bunker or an in-place position, it means you're not going to miss on the first shot. And, uh, you know, these 9 millimeter tracer rounds in the in the 7.62 casing, they're a hell of a lot cheaper than the actual missile itself. So, you know, it's it's there for first shot accuracy. Arsenality93 says, Hey Stu, just wondering, seeing as you review an adult game for adults and you yourself are an adult, why do you feel you can't swear? Well, I'm, I'm no real stranger to swearing. I'm perfectly aware of all the cool, naughty words. It's just, it's true, I, I don't really sort of use them. The principal reason for this is uh, not because I really want to self-censor myself, just because I don't particularly have a need to use them. I mean, I don't know, I don't think it would be really helpful when talking about the game in a prescriptive manner. You know, you don't want to drop an F-bomb in there. You don't want to say the Mark 48 is a fudging high damage LMG. It has a certain degree of emphasis, but it also colours the, uh, the sort of sentence with unnecessary tones, I think. As for on these videos, I uh, bodlerize, uh, that is to say I replace rude words with less rude words, like stuff and fudge, because I think it's rather funny. It serves as a counter to the rather foul-mouthed uh, world of Xbox Live, where all these 13, 14, 15 year olds, you know, they're, they're keen to assert their independence from, from their strict parents, and they do so by saying, all of these uh, rude words that they've seen in the, the films that they weren't supposed to watch because they're rated 18. So these, these younglings, they go into the Xbox Live thinking they're all independent and cool and adult by, you know, spouting stuff like yippee ki -yay, mother fudger. And as you grow up a little bit, you kind of realise that, well, okay, fine, these words exist and they do have a function, you know? If I hit my thumb with a hammer, you can, you can probably bet that I, I shall be saying some, you know, unpleasant words. When I play Call of Duty with friends, of course I'm going to say stuff. You know, it happens. It's part of the sort of the common language on, you know, on gaming. There's a fudging camper in, in the central building, you know, that sort of thing. But this is all sort of, you know, private communication or just sort of interpersonal stuff. When you take it into um, a broader scope, when you're talking to a large audience, there is probably a greater need for a more restrained tone. And that is, you know, one of the reasons I I don't indulge in the, the bluer aspects of language. It is because, by and large, these words are not particularly useful. Generally speaking, they are so commonly uttered that they don't really have much meaning. And to be perfectly honest, the depth of the English language really does extend to much more colourful terms for you know, the, um, the mild pejoratives that are out there. I would sooner say, you know, devastate, destroy, decimate, annihilate. These, these are really sort of, these are powerful words in the right context, more powerful than just fudging someone's stuff up. That's trite, it doesn't really mean much, and you have also the potential for offending people. People get offended by swear words. 
And I know, I know, maybe they should harden up. But to me, there's, there's more than just the issue of offending people. It's also about using the English language to its fullest and not just resorting to the same old words over and over again. I like to serve as a fairly good role model for the Call of Duty crowd and uh, as far as the English language is concerned, I consider myself a subversive uh, lesson in the matters of language. I have people's interest and whilst I have that interest, I may as well cram a few vocabulary words into the lesson. It also helps me, I mean, it, to write at a higher level rather than dumbing things down keeps my writing acuity sort of keen. By and large, though, the gaming community, as far as language is concerned, is absolutely abysmal. It goes beyond even the, you know, the, the common swear words. And there's this sort of, I don't know, it's almost, uh, it's very deep-seated and it's, it is quite unfortunate in some cases. But there's the casual use of not just the common swear words, but also sometimes quite misogynistic terms. Now, I'm no feminist, if anything, I'm an egalitarian. But uh, sometimes the, the casual sexism present in gaming, particularly in certain scenes like uh, fighting games, and to, to an extent stuff like Call of Duty, uh, it's, it's pretty terrible and it's, it's casually thrown around. I don't much care for that, I have to be perfectly honest. All over the place you see comments like, get back to the kitchen, you know, make me a sandwich, and you see the trivialization of words like, like rape. This is quite a heavy issue for a whole separate video, I think, but uh, no, I don't like that at all. You did well at a game of Call of Duty. You didn't rape them, that's not what that term means, and you cheapen that term by using it. Destroy, decimate, annihilate, all of these are better terms. It is not like the English language is lacking in terms for performing well on the field of battle. Violence has, has saturated our history, and we have a whole host of colourful terms to describe that. Anyway, I don't want to turn this into a, a lecture on the use of language in the video game scene. I already have to an extent, I appreciate, but, uh, but anyway, that sort of covers my approach to, uh, to language, I think. So thank you very much for watching, and I shall join you on Friday for the QBB LSW Weapon Guide. And while I'd like to say that I'll join you on Sunday for the Holographic or the EOTech Guide, I should say, um, it's unlikely to happen for, well, I have a sniper rifle next. So I'm probably going to get a head start on getting clips with the DSR-50. So anyway, until I see you next, farewell.